Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. We're going to show a little exploration for you involving the derivatives of sine and cosine. You can see I've got a line with slope 1 going through the origin, and I've also got a dot on the y-axis at 1 that represents its slope. Notice that if I move the dot up and down on the axis, I can change the slope of my line to whatever value I move my dot. So my dot here shows the slope of my line. If we now place the sine function in our picture and watch the slope of the tangent line as we move along the sine graph, you can see that it stays parallel to my line that I was moving before using my dot. This means my moving dot on the axis represents the tangent slope for the graph of sine. Now if I let my dot travel horizontally as it moves, you can see that it traces out a similar looking graph and that is actually the graph of the cosine function. So from this, we can see that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. I'll do a similar thing with the slope of my line through the origin, starting horizontal this time. You can see here I'm controlling the slope of the line by moving the dot up and down to different values on the axis. If we place the cosine function in our picture, and I move my dot up and down in the same way, you can see that the tangent line on the cosine graph stays parallel to my other line. So my moving dot represents the tangent slope on the cosine graph. If I let my dot now also move horizontally, you can see it traces out a graph that looks a bit like the graph of sine x, but actually it's upside down. So our dot here has actually traced out the graph of negative sine x, and we know that the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. So you can see if I start with a function of sine x, and I take the derivative, and then I take the derivative of that again, I get negative sine x. Think about what would happen now if we took the derivative again, took the derivative of negative sine x. Think of this as negative 1 out front times sine x. The derivative of the sine x part would be cosine x, so we would get negative 1 times cosine x, which would give us negative cosine x. If we took now a derivative yet again, the derivative of negative cosine x, think of this as negative 1 out front cosine x. We know that the derivative of cosine x is actually negative sine x, so if I took the derivative, this part would become negative sine x, but because we already have a negative out front, that would actually give us a result of positive sine x. And so you can see that starting with a function of sine x and taking the derivative four times actually gets us back to the function sine x. We have a similar pattern for all of these. It doesn't matter which one we start with. If we start in the upper left, we know the derivative of sine x is cosine x. The derivative of that is negative sine x. The derivative of that is negative cosine x. And the derivative of that is back to sine x. A similar thing would happen if we started in the upper right with cosine x. We would go to negative sine x, then to negative cosine x, to sine x, and then back to cosine x. So for doing the derivatives of sine and cosine, there's a nice cycle where you will simply repeat every four derivatives. For those of you looking for a more formal way of how we derive the derivative of sine and cosine, we'll go ahead and work that through using the limit definition of the derivative. So the derivative of sine x would be the limit as h approaches 0, remember of f of x plus h minus f of x on top, over h on the bottom. So our f of x plus h becomes sine of x plus h. Our f of x is just sine x. If we look at the first thing in the numerator and we see sine of x plus h, we can actually use a sum formula, like a sum and difference formula for sine, where sine of a plus b is equal to sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b. So sine of x plus h, using that formula, actually becomes sine of x cosine of h plus cosine x sine of h. So using our identity, we arrive at this. You'll notice that in the top, we actually have two terms that have sine x in them. So we'll go ahead and bring those together and factor them out. If I factor out sine x from this term and this term, I would have cosine h left here and I would have negative one left in the back. So we get sine of x times the quantity cosine h minus one plus cosine x sine h. All of that over h, we take the limit as h approaches zero. Now you'll notice that two of these functions in here, sine and cosine of x, both have nothing to do with h approaching zero. So we'll go ahead and split these up separately, and we'll pull the sine of x and the cosine x out and just look at the h information 
as our limit. So if I split up this first half and pull the sine x outside of the limit, we have the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h. If we take this back half of the fraction and split it out, we then pull the cosine x out front of the limit, since the limit only involves h and there's no h in cosine x. Then we have the limit as h approaches 0 of sine h over h. If we look at the graphs of each of these expressions to find our limit, so first let's look at the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h. If we look at the graph of cosine h minus 1 over h, and as we let h approach 0, we'll notice that our graph approaches an open dot at the origin, and this is a y value of 0. So we know that this limit here next to sine x is actually 0, so our first half becomes sine of x times 0. Now let's look at the limit as h approaches 0 of sine h over h. That is a graph that we might have seen already, sine of x over x as x approaches 0, here just with h in its place. So if you look at the graph of sine of h over h or sine of x over x, you'll notice that we approach an open hole at a value of y equals 1 on the axis here. So this limit as h approaches 0 is actually 1. So we get sine of x times 0 plus cosine of x times 1, and that of course is going to just give us cosine x. So here we can see using the limit definition of the derivative that sine x derivative is cosine of x. We can do a similar thing with the derivative of cosine x, thinking of it as the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Here we have the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine of x plus h minus cosine x over h. We can use a sum difference formula here now for cosine. So remember that cosine of a plus b is actually cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b. So here we would get from our identity the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x cosine h minus sine x sine h. We have our minus cosine x in the back and all of that over h. Now if you look at terms that have something in common up top, you'll notice cosine x is in common in two of these up top. So we go ahead and factor cosine x out of those terms, and we get that cosine x times cosine h was this term, and cosine x times negative 1 was this term. So we get cosine x times the quantity cosine h minus 1, minus our signs in the back all over h. We'll do a similar thing in splitting up these fractions. So we'll have the limit as h approaches 0 now of cosine h minus 1 over h. Now with our cosine x out front of the limit, since there's no h to worry about as far as taking the limit. And in the back, we have a minus here. We can pull the sine x out in front of our limit since there's no h present there. And just think about the limit as h approaches 0 of sine h over h. These are the same limits that we looked at before. Remember this limit as h approaches 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h was 0, and this limit as h approaches 0 of sine of h over h was 1. So we get cosine times 0 minus sine of x times 1, and that gives us negative sine x. Alright everyone, good luck with your sine and cosine derivatives. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.